Um, so as you know, this is a night to celebrate the great author Nick Joaquin, um, who's often described as the Gabriel Garcia Marquez of the Philippines. Those Gina pointed out, um, he wrote several decades before Marquez <laughs> did himself. Um, but I think like Marquez, Joaquin's work, um, uh, the, the comparison strikes because of the combination of uh, using magical realist techniques as a way to describe the essential like, post-colonial or colonial condition. Um, this book by Penn and Classics is, is actually the first time Joaquin has been published in the United States and um, we're delighted to work with Penn and Classics as they've been publishing a number of um, both East Asian and or Asian titles as well as Filipino books like the Rizal books. Um, uh, as you know, probably Rizal was born, born in 1917 and wrote a surreal, anguished, long sentence that cast an ironic, humorous eye at colonialism's long durée gender, Catholic rights, all of which he dealt with through a kind of surreal magical realism and a Baroque splendor. The book has an excellent forward by Gina and a introduction by Vicente Rafael who contextualizes Nick Joaquin within a larger context of Spanish and American colonialism and global capitalism. And as he writes in the introduction, lingering on the threshold of what had happened and what was yet to come, he found himself irresistibly drawn, like the angel of history, to the debris of colonial catastrophes that just kept piling up around him. He sought to retrieve the ruins of modernity, the means for conveying experience, his own as well as others, in stories about forgotten legends, repressed events, flawed fathers, two naveled women, and the miracles of a merciful virgin that continue to emerge from the ever-perplexing and vertigo-inducing history of a certain Philippines. Um, so uh, our moderator tonight is Melissa Sippen, who's done a number of events here and written for The Margins. Um, she's the winner of a number of prizes, including uh, the Glimmer Train Fiction Open, Washington Square Reviews Flash Fiction Prize. She co-edited Cuento, Lost Things, um, which were fiction responses to uh, Filipino myths of um, magical creatures, um, and we held an event here for it and is the co-founder and editor-in-chief of Tayo Literary Magazine. Let's give Melissa a hand. Hello, everyone. I wanted to thank Asian Americans Writers Workshop for inviting me to moderate when I don't even live here. <laughs> um, so it's, it's a really a, a honor and a gift to celebrate with you all, Nick Joaquin and um, the three authors today who I look up to as my precursors. Um, of, of Filipino-American writers. So our first uh, person up is Gina Apostol. Gina Apostol wrote the introduction to the Joaquin Collection. Her first two novels, Bibliolepsy and The Revolution, according to Raymundo Mata, both won the Juan Laya Prize for the novel. Gina's third novel, Gun Dealer's Daughter, won the 2013 Penn Open Book Award. Her essays and stories have appeared in the New York Times, LA Review of Books, Foreign Policy, Gettysburg Review, and the Massachusetts Review. Please welcome Gina Apostol. Hello, thanks for coming, and thank you again, Asian American Writers Workshop, for um, celebrating Nick Joaquin. It is the centennial of Nick Joaquin's birthday, so he was born in 1917. So when I talk about decades, he wrote for seven decades. So when I talk about the fact that um, he's been, he, he wrote for quite some time, um, Mass of St. Silvestre, which is a story I'm reading, uh, was published in 1940. I was going to read one of the woman stories because that's so powerful in Nick Joaquin, but maybe Ninochka will read one of those. Um, I'm reading Mass of St. Silvestre. Um, uh, thinking about some of the questions that Melissa was asking. To open their doors to the new year, the Romans invoked the god Janus, patron of doors and of beginnings, whose two faces, one staring forward, the other backward, caricature man's ability to dwell in the past while speeding into the future. In Christianity, the post of Janus has been taken over by another Roman, Saint Silvestre, Pope and Confessor, whose feast falls on the last day of the year. At midnight of that day, 
the papal saint appears on earth and with the keys of his office opens the gates of all the principal archiepiscopal archi cities and celebrates the first mass of the year in their cathedrals. Manila has always been a cathedral city, almost from its foundation. For centuries, it was one of the only two cities in the Orient, Goa being the other, to whose gates the New Year's key bearer made his annual visitation. For this purpose, St. Silvestre always used the Puerta, Puerta Postigo, which is of the seven gates of our city, the one reserved for the private use of the viceroy and the archbishops. St. Silvestre comes arrayed in cloth of gold and crowned with a tiara. Holy knights suspend a pallium above him. Archangels swing censers and wave peacock fans. At the Puerta Postigo, the heavenly multitude kneels down as St. Silvestre advances with the keys to open the noble and ever loyal city of Manila to the new year. The city's bells ring out as the gate opens and St. Andrew and his companions come forth to greet the heavenly embassy, St. Andrew being the principal patron of Manila, accompanied by Santa Potenciana, who is our minor patroness, and by St. Francis and St. Dominic, the guardians of our walls. The bells continue pealing throughout the enchanted hour and break into a really gl glorious uproar as St. Sylvester rises to bestow the final benediction. But when the clocks strike one o'clock, the bells instantly fall mute, the thundering music breaks off, the heavenly companies vanish, and in the cathedral, so lately glorious, there is suddenly only the silence, only the chilly darkness of the empty naves, and at the altar the single light burning before the body of God. Those who have been favored with glimpses of these ceremonies report that St. Sylvester, like Janus, seems to have two faces, but these reports are too vague, too confused, and conflicting to be given credence. More respectable is the ancient belief that whoever sees and hears in its entirety this mass of New Year's of St. Sylvester will see a thousand more New Year's, and it is whispered that Ma Messer Nostradamus succeeded through black magic and witnessing one such mass, while most of Roger Bacon's last experiments, according to Fray Alber Albertus Magnus, were on a prism that should make visible to mortal eyes this mass of time's key bearer. They also speak of a certain Magus of Manila, who, like Nostradamus, intruded with black magic upon the sacred scene and was punished for it. This Magus, who was known as Mateo de Mestre, lived in Manila during the early part of the 18th century and was feared by many as a sorcerer. He was equally famed as a musician, artist, doctor, philosopher, chemist, etc., etc., etc. Just go. Um, de Mestre, a small, very shriveled ancient with white hair flowing down to his shoulders and a thin white beard, might look as frail as a mummy, but his eyes and his temper were still as sharp as a child's because no one remembers him young. He was believed to be 100 years old, hundreds of years old, surviving, some said, from the days before conquista, when being a priest of the ancient cults, he wielded great power, wearing his hair long and affecting the clothes and the ways of women, but had hidden away from the Castilians in various animal disguises to plot a restoration of the old gods, those fierce and fearful old gods now living in exile on the mountaintops and in dense forests and out among the haunted islands of the south, but who steal abroad when the moon dies and when typhoons rage in the night, at which time you may invoke the presence by roasting a man's liver and by other unspeakable devices. The truth, however, was that Mateo de Mestre was not yet 80 years old. Anyway, Mateo de Mestre, he wants to um, be able to see the Mass because it could increase his life by thousands of years. He had consulted the dark deities in exile, but was informed that the holy mysteries, except by divine dispensation, could be observed only by the eyes of the dead. Whereupon a monstrous idea had grown. The grave of a holy man was profaned. The dead eyes plucked out, and one New Year's Eve, Mateo de Mestre hid himself in the cathedral, having grafted into his eye sockets a pair of eyeballs ravished from the dead. So he sees the mass. Having been warned 
that the mass of St. Sylvester cannot but prove unbearable to human senses, including like the atmosphere of Great High Sacoma and the mortal of Beholder, he had brought along a knife and a bag of limes, wounding his arms and steeping the wounds with the limes each time he felt sleep threatening to overcome him. Of course, we know what happened to him. He kind of fell asleep. Um, <clears throat> so what happened to him was he saw St. Silvestre, he dropped down slowly, irresistibly to his knees, still staring, still fascinated, his mouth agape. Then he ceased to move, his bones stiffened, his flesh froze. There he knelt, moveless, one more kneeling and fascinated figure in a tableau of kneeling and fascinated figures. Ma Matteo da Mestro had turned into stone. And there he has remained all these years. And for generations, bad boys who drowse at ma mass have had his crouching form pointed out as a warning. But, his, but every New Year's Eve at midnight, he returns to life. And so it will be with him until he has been a thousand New Years. Or has the spell broken for him at last? For his retablo is broken. The cathedral is broken. And the city he knew has been wiped out by magic more practical and effective than any he ever dreamt of. And just as soon as the liberation forces opened the walled city to the public, this is completely in the story. There's, they're just ellipses. I went to see what war had left us of our heritage from four centuries. Nothing had been left except the oldest and most priceless jewel of all, St. Augustine's. The Puerta Postiga still stands, but most of the city's walls have been leveled to the ground, and the cathedral is a field of rubble. Into what city, I wondered, would St. Silvestre now make his annual entry? In what cathedral would he say his mass? Later, I told this story to some GI friends who straightaway clamored that a buddy of theirs, while stationed in the walled city, had actually witnessed this entry and mass of St. Sylvester on New Year's Eve, 1945. Unfortunately, the buddy had gone home to the States, but I took down his address and immediately wrote to him, begging for a full account. His name is Francis Xavier Shadolaschik, and he lives on Barnum Street in Brooklyn. Here is the letter he sent me. I didn't know all that about a living a thousand years. We were camped just outside the walls, on the grassland between the walls and the port companies. That night, it was New Year's Eve, I'd come back to camp early because I was feeling homesick. I was all alone in our tent. The other boys were still downtown celebrating. Around midnight, I woke up from a doze and heard music. So I stuck my head out. And so he sees this mass. I told you about not being surprised. I wasn't. I simply felt I should go and take a look. So I dressed out, dressed fast and ran out. The parade had stopped at a ga gate in the wall and a bishop was opening the gate and the bells began ringing. Inside it was a real city, an old city, and hundreds of bells were ringing. And they had a park with fountains all around. And beside the park was a cathedral. Everybody was going in there, so I did too. You never saw such a sight. The bishops were saying mass and was all lighted up. Then I said to myself, what a picture you could take of this. So I raced back to our camp and got my camera. When I reached the cathedral, I could see that the mass was ending. I aimed for a nice view. But right when I was, right when I was going to snap the shutter, the bell stopped ringing. And just like that. It all disappeared. The bright light was only moonlight, and the music was only the wind. There was no crowd and no bishop and no altar and no cathedral. I was standing on a stack of ruins, and there was nothing but ruins around, just blocks and blocks of ruins stretching all around me in the silent moonlight. Thank you, Gina. That's actually my favorite short story in the whole collection. And I'll talk about why in the Q&A. Um, our next reader is Alex Gavari. Alex's novel, From the Memoirs of a Non-Enemy Combatant, won the Hornblower Award for First Fiction, was named a Best New Voice in 2012 by Bookspan, and selected by the New York Times as an Editor's Choice. 
a National Book Foundation 5 under 35 nominee. Alex has received fellowships from the Harry Ransom Center and the Norman Mailer Center. His essays and criticism has been in The Nation, Boston Globe, NPR's All Things Considered, and many other publications. His second novel, which is what we're trying to win for the raffle, <laughs> Eastman Was Here, is forthcoming from Viking in August 2012. Please welcome Alex. Why am I clapping on the way up? <laughs> Welcome me. All right, I'll just get this. Um, Gina wrote a really beautiful um, foreword to this book, and um, you shouldn't skip it. It really puts Nick Joaquin's um, short stories and his work in context. I had only read a couple uh, Joaquin stories before. Um, before uh, receiving um, this book, it's really, I got to spend the last two weeks with it. It's really wonderful. Um, I always think a writer should, and this is probably wrong, but I love it when a writer captures his time and place, and Joaquin really um, does that with Manila in several, uh, several different time periods. But um, the story I'm going to read from, I think, is sort of like a contemporary story that. Um, uh, it takes place post-war. It was published in the 60s. Um, and he really captures Manila at that time. It's, it's wonderful. Um, so this is from the title story, The Woman Who Had Two Navels. When she told him she had two navels, he believed her at once. She seemed so urgently, so desperately serious. And besides... What would be the point in telling a lie like that, he asked himself, while she asked him if he could help her, if he could arrange something surgical, an operation. But I'm only a horse doctor, he apologized, to which she scathingly retorted, well, if he could fix up horses, and she cried that it was urgent, her whole life depended on it. He inquired how old she was and noted, while she replied that she was 30, how her eyes turned cagey for the first time since she came into the room. He wondered, putting on his spectacles, if she might be knocking off a few years, but could not tell, for the stylized face with the black hat pulled low over it recorded no time in years, only in hours. But does my age matter, she asked, turning coy. And are you married, he primly pursued. She nodded and slipping off a glove displayed her left hand, the thread of metal around the third finger not more polished than the flesh it bound. With children? No, she, again, she sounded cautious. But I've not been married long, she quickly added. And more quickly still, defiantly, the truth is, she rapped out, I was married only this morning. His face went blank, and she began to tell him about her life. When I was a little girl, I thought everybody else had two navels. Oh, you smile. You've never had to face a fact that was yours only, not general data. You were a nice boy, weren't you, doctor? And lovingly sheltered. I can see that. You've always lived in the world where people have the right number of navels. But I shared, or thought I shared, the world only when I was very little. I was the eve of the apple at five years old. That was when I found out. I was walking with my doll one hot day in our garden, and we came to a pond with goldfish in it. I decided that Minnie, Minnie was my doll, that she wanted to wash. So we sat down by the pond, and I discovered that she had only one navel. I felt so sorry, I cried, rocking her naked little body in my arms, trying to comfort her, and promising not to throw her away like the others. And then I became thoughtful. The day was growing dark all around me. It was going to rain. But whom was I sorry for? Which of us was wrong? I sat very still by that pond, my tears flowing and the raindrops starting to fall. I carefully examined Minnie again, and when I found that she had other parts missing, I grew calmer. But I had grown crafty, too. Nobody must know that I suspected. 
poor Minnie would have to be sacrificed because I had torn her clothes off and could not put them back on again. I hardly noticed the thunderstorm as I hunted around for a string and a big stone. I tied the stone to Minnie, kissed her for the last time, and dropped her into the pond. I threw in my bracelet, too. Then I ran home soaking wet and told the grown-ups that a thief had grabbed me and had stolen my bracelet and doll. They didn't believe me, of course. There were always armed guards planted all over the house. If you pushed a chair, you bruised a detective. But everybody pretended to believe me. Nothing happened to me except that night in my dreams, the goldfish ate poor Minnie. And I was there in the pond watching and was not sorry. After that was like Eve after the apple. I was very careful about keeping myself well covered up, especially when there were other children around being careless. I found out about them. They never found out about me. How about your family, he asked. She said she was an only child. Mother knows, of course. I don't know about father. When mother or the maids gave me a bath, they put on such matter-of-fact faces. I was often tempted to point at myself and giggle. I knew that they knew that I knew. But we all pretended that I didn't and that they didn't. The setup was perfect for blackmail. I never had to threaten them aloud. If you beget a monster of a child, it could prove you were rather monstrous yourself. I did what I pleased and was never punished. Can you imagine what kind of a childhood it was, if it was a childhood at all? But once past the teens, when you know how just one pimple can be such a torment, so think what I went through. She had become indifferent. She had realized it was silly to squander thought and tears on so trivial an oddity. She stopped worrying. My one big scare was that when it became stylish to bear the midriff. Imagine. They would have been like pigs, eyes peering out. But she had taken ill and stayed in bed until the style staled. She had fallen in love with several boys who wanted to marry her, but she had always drawn back. She dreaded a husband's eyes on her secret. He might be horrified. I could never have stood that. Or he might say I had cheated. So she had put off and put off marrying until suddenly she was 30 and she turned frantic. Thank you. You're really tall, Alex. <laughs> um, thank you for that. A really beautiful reading of the woman with two no navels. Our next read, uh, reader and writer is Nenosha Roska. Can you hear me now? <laughs> okay. Uh. Yeah. yeah, I think I think both of us need the. <laughs> so Nenosha Roska, um, one is a really seminal writer of Philippine literature, and what she says about Nick Wakane is this. One cannot overstate what Nick Joaquin is to Philippine literature. Writing in English with the melody of Spanish and Tagalog, Nick Joaquin was the first Filipino writer to focus on the impossible contradictions of a tribal civilization overlain by Spanish and American worldviews. And because that tribal civilization was woman-centered, Nick Joaquin's her heroines are, co are as complex, romantic, and defiant as Ma Madame Bovary and Anna Karenina. Rosca is a legendary organizer for women's liberation and is engaged in the study and codification of theory and the practice of transnational and intersectional feminism. Her two novels, State of War and Twice Blessed, are considered classics of modern Philippine literature, with the second receiving the American Book Award. Please welcome Ninoska Rosca. I have fans, yay! <laughs> Hi, I kind of decided not to read today, but to talk about Nick Joaquin. 
because I think I'm the only person in the entire United States <laughs> who actually grew up uh, knowing Nick. So I did a short piece called uh, Reading Walking at 13. <laughs> now, uh, this is a very beautiful collection. There are two of my favorite short stories are here. The first one is The Order of Melchizedek. And it's my favorite only because Nick told me the week before it came out. I have a story coming out next week. You read it. <laughs> and so I read it and I went back to him and I asked, why did you make me read it? Because you are Manichaean. I'm like, what is that? <laughs> but you have to read the story to find out what that is. My second favorite story is Mayday Eve. And I thank you for giving me the chance to mourn, in a way, the passing of a friend whose passing I did not have time to mourn. Ha! Huh. To this day, I still miss the guy. I miss him uh, drinking beer and screaming, Beer! <laughs> I miss him, uh, you know, when I go to his office, I miss him bellowing, singing at the top of his voice, you're the opera. Tosca, you're the Nazca Rosca, you're the top. You know, he, he's, he's, he's like that. I am very pleased that this Penguin Classic Edition has come out. Um, Mayday Eve. I came to this story at the end of a period of reading literature that lay outside the parameters of what was normally taught in Philippine schools. I was reading, uh, for some strange reason I cannot fathom up to now, I was reading The Dream of the Red Chamber, uh, The Book of the Dead, the Bhagavad Gita. I had no idea why I was doing this. And also, one whole summer, I read all the Dostoevsky I could find. <laughs> I was around 10, 11 years old. You can imagine. <laughs> yeah. And on top of that, my aunts and my mothers would, my, my aunts and my mother would gather every uh, once a month and start talking and telling stories about, you know, this, that, and all our cousins whom I never met. Okay. The first paragraph of Mayday Eve brought me abruptly to the legend of my great-grandmother who drove her own carriage, urging her horse to frenzied running while she smoked cigarillos, the lighted end inside her mouth. She was the mistress of a priest. But it was, this kind of frenzy was contained. Okay. As Nick Joaquin wrote in May Day Eve, the old people had ordered that the dancing should stop at 10 o'clock. But it was almost midnight before the carriages came filing up to the front door, the servants running to and fro with torches to light the departing guests, while the girls who were staying were promptly herded upstairs to the bedroom, the young men gathering around to wish them a good night and lamenting their ascent with mock sighs and moanings, proclaiming themselves disconsolate, but straightway going off to finish the punch and the brandy. At 13, you read this, and you realize that contained in that very first paragraph 
were several rather curious negations of what appeared to be, but was not. An indication of the many layers of subtext to life in the Philippines. What the old people decreed could be defied. Because the joy of being young took precedence. What the young men declared did not match their internal topography. Reading the story when one was preparing for one's assault upon the world and existence, while grappling with the many contradi contradictions of one's upbringing, May Day Eve was an eye-opener. We will have to return to the context of the times. This was a time when the United States reigned supreme in the Philippines, bringing its concept of linear time and one-dimensional relationships and interactions, even as the indications of the rising of a dark force from the belly button of an alleged democracy was already visible. Ferdinand Marcos was forging, was uh, forging, 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 forging his Japanese occupation records and buying medals to create his own mythology. Even as we, the young girls, watched the romantic comedies of Doris Day and Rock Hudson movies. I was totally punished when I said, but Rock Hudson is gay, because at the time nobody was gay. As in May Day Eve, the concern of girls then was how to fulfill the traditional pattern of getting married, having a good family, with a side career which shouldn't interfere with the conduct of a traditional family. Hence, the story centerpiece is the search for a partner who would make this possible. Agueda slips into a darkened living room and looks into the big mirror there. I don't know why our living room used to have this big mirror. We had a big mirror in the living room. But she slipped there, looks into the mirror, and chants, mirror, mirror, show to me. Him whose woman I will be. Of course, me having been brought up on Grimm's fairy tales and all of these Western uh, childhood stories, this was something new. Because in contrast to the narcissism of the queen who looked into the mirror and said, who is the fairest of them all? This girl looked into the mirror searching for the other. And I thought, this is how women's life is supposed to be in the Philippines. Not to look for the fairest, but to look for the other. And the other is, as Agueda says, good looking, wearing fine clothes, etc., etc., etc. And it was young Badoy who would catch himself at the very instant of falling in love and vowing never, never, never to forget this night of his meeting Agueda. But alas, and this is Joaquin's words, the heart forgets. The heart is distracted and May time passes, summer ends, the storms break over the rut-ripe orchards. The heart grows old, while the hours, the days, the months, and the years pile up and pile up till the mind becomes too crowded, too confused, and dust gathers in it. Cobwebs multiply, the walls darken, and fall into ruin and decay. The memory perishes. And then we learn of the cruel prank that May Day Eve plays on the young woman and the young man. Only decades later, when Badoy has become an old man and chances upon his grandson, 
peering into the same mirror, a candle in his hand, and intoning, mirror, mirror, show to me her whose lover I will be. In the mirror, in the mirror of time, Agueva had seen the devil, while Badoy had seen a witch. And the story ends quite brilliantly with this. From up the street came the clackety clack of the watchman's boots on the cobbles, and the clang clang of his lantern against his knee, and the mighty roll of his great voice booming through the night. Guardia Sereno, a las doce andado. A night, a season, an instant of falling in love that reverberates through three generations, nullifying its own romantic essence, and therefore separate and isolated from the events that birthed it. Consider that our generation was grappling with a new linear time springing from U.S. dominance of the culture. I read May Day Eve and heard that line from the Bhagavad Gita, the one that uh, Robert Oppenheimer misquoted <laughs> or changed forever, it seems. The actual text says, I am become time, destroyer of worlds. Thank you. Thank you for that, Nanoska. That was really wonderful um, to share that and your friendship with Nick. Um, I think we're going to do the raffle, right? Is that correct? We're going to do three more tickets and then have the Q&A afterwards, if we can get the basket. <laughs> so please get your tickets out. <laughs> All right. Okay, the last two numbers is 57. Is that you? No. no. <laughs> it's not me. <laughs> 57? Okay. No, I can't read. <laughs> well, if you, if you want, please go to the back. <laughs> okay, next one is 60. Oh. Yay, let's clap. Woo! <laughs> and then, last two numbers is 82. 82. Voila. 82? Raise your hand. Okay, okay. Thank you. Let's clap. <laughs> Okay, may I please ask the three writers to come up? Okay, you can, can you guys hear me? Is that okay? Yes, yes? okay, thank you. Uh, so thank you, uh, you three, so much for sharing the words of Nick Joaquin and also the anal analysis of May Day Eve. My first question will be, we'll talk about how Nick Joaquin has influenced your own work. For me as a writer, as a Filipino-American writer who grew up in Carson, which is a Filipino town in Los Angeles, I didn't read any Filipino writers in my, in my childhood. And I do feel like because my family was so obsessed with assimilation, I didn't even learn Tagalog. And by not learning my own, oh, Il Ilocana, because Ilocano, because I'm Ilocana, I kind of lost something from not reading the writers from my homeland and the writers who talked about America and its colonizing power over our culture and over our bodies. So my first question will be, 
How has Nick Joaquin influenced your own creative work? In your opinion, how has Nick Joaquin influenced American and Philippine literature in a transnational sense, especially as a writer of three tongues, um, Spanish, Tagalog, and English? And lastly, for you, what does the American publication of this wonderful collection mean? Oh, okay. Um, I actually don't. I mean, I, I, I don't remember when I began reading Nick Joaquin. I just remember that I've always been reading. That's for me. I feel like I've always been reading. Nick. He is so powerful for me as a writer because, um, like Mayday E, for instance, where. You expect it, you know, you expect a fairy tale, and it's really, he's a demon. The person in the mirror is this demon who's actually your husband, um, who becomes your husband. So the husband is this demon. And then summer solstice, I mean, I'm, that is indelible. I mean, that is a crazy story. I mean, that, um, so I grew up, I, I don't know, I, I don't know how I've been influenced by Nick Joaquin, to be honest, because um, as a Filipino growing up and reading these, and then I was an English major too, reading the stories, reading the work, um, I guess my influence has been that I just love the way he wrote. And it made me want, he always made me want to write. Just write. Just reading, I want to write. After reading Nick Joaquin, I want to write. Um, I... Uh like I said before I read, I, um, I only read like one or two stories by him because you couldn't get them here. You know, I bought a collection, like the best Philippine uh, short stories of the century when I was in Manila. When I was in Manila, you know, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, and I was able to read him through that. And um, I remember I read him because I thought his name was cool. <laughs> I was like, because there were hundreds of people yeah, in this yeah, collection. Yeah. I was like, oh, what a cool name. <laughs> and I, re I really liked it. I think Summer Solstice was the first story mm -hmm. that I had read. And then um, I just think it's a real treasure to have this beautiful collection um, published in, in Penguin Classics. Um, and I, th I heard that you were sort of integral to... This, com this book coming to be? Elda uh, was. Elda is the publisher of Penguin Classics, and all I did was send her an email. <laughs> well, <laughs> very important email. <laughs> Thank you, Elda. Elda is the uh, publisher, the editor of uh, this collection. Um, how did you, uh, well, you're not up here, but I wanted to, <laughs> maybe later, I wanted to ask how these stories were selected because it is not just one collection of stories that they brought over here. It's, a, it's just many stories kind of pulled together. But also it's a really, just it's such a fantastic read and the way they were selected, I'm very interested in. Because you, have, that, in you have to understand, process. he's very, he is a journalist. I mean, you talked about that. And so I read his, jour his journalism too. I read A Question of Heroes, his history stuff. He's also a poet. So he's a lot of different things. And a playwright. And a playwright. Yeah. Okay. Well, I was around 15 years old when I met uh, Nick. Uh, I must have been something. Because <laughs> he did not like me. <laughs> but um, I will not say he influenced my writing, but I will say that uh, without his characters, especially his women characters, I do not think I and the other women of the Philippines would have had our rebellion mm -hmm. as fiercely and as in your face mm -hmm. as we did. Mm -hmm. Because almost all the women characters in Philippine literature, all those characters were very subdued. And it was only Nick who wrote with such ferocity, you know, with uh, women characters who are really ferocious. That was the first. The second was, I think he gave validation to my group of writers, young writers, who were breaking the rules of uh, 
the professors at the university who were trained in uh, new criticism. You know, text and only text. Boring. <laughs> but so we were breaking it and it was a very traumatic times. So we had some writers who killed themselves because of the pushback from the professors. But Nick Nick's writing, the use of uh, this melody, which was really not mm -hmm. English. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and writing in as many languages as one wa was familiar with. And mixing. Because the Philippines is truly a bilingual or trilingual nation. We would stop in the middle of a sentence and switch to another language. You know, and do it effortlessly. It's a real bilingual nation. So in those terms, he was a very, very major influence. Um, yeah, he, and this is very strange. I saw some of the early stories of Gabriel Garcia Marquez some years ago yeah, you're, you're when they put them out. And I was like, this, these <laughs> stories are he like them already. <laughs> my stories when I was writing at 16, 17, you know, the same yeah. kind of madness that you don't know what was happening. Anyway, that's it. One thing I would say about Nick Wilkin is actually very, he's very dangerous for a writer because he's so seductive. Yeah. And so you want to not, you want to like, you, you have to be careful because he really, he's, he's too powerful, I think. So um, I think that that would, yeah, I, I, do, you, do you get that? Yeah, yeah. so he's too, his language is too powerful. So uh, there's one thing that is really refreshing about these, uh, these short stories because now in you know the age of the MFA, everybody's like, oh, all the stories are the same, and mm -hmm. you know, I mean, there is some kind of formulaic or formula sometimes to um, American short story, contemporary mm -hmm. American short stories. Boring. Yeah, <laughs> boring. <laughs> um, but his, I teach, I teach a little bit now, and I teach a stor short story all the time, and his short stories are so refreshing, the way they're structured. Yeah. Like that, um, uh, you know, many of the stories don't even begin with the main character. Yeah. You know, some, yeah. some sort of character that's, uh, you know, on, on the side, right. who had heard this tale, and yeah. then... The way he moves perspective, uh, points right. of view and perspective, it's and really time. very interesting. I and think time. You can learn a lot, as a writer, you can time. learn a lot from Nick Joaquin about time. I think even that Mass of St. Sylvester, he just does this ellipses, and then suddenly you're in World War II. Right. 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 And that kind of leads to my second question, where I talk about the Mass of St. Sylvester, which is a story about telling a story. Um, it's about a magical mass that ap appears in all the Christendom, and only the dead can see it. So what this maestro does, it uh, excavates a dead man, gets his eyes, sees this mass, but then is turned to stone. But then World War II comes and destroys the church in which this mass comes, comes um, as incantation. And what happens when that, ch that that church or that cathedral is destroyed? What happens when a culture is destroyed? And kind of the focus of that short story is time itself. And also erasure and memory. So my, and for me in, in the traditional workshop, I was taught you can't tell that kind of story. Like I wrote this one short story and everyone hated me for it. <laughs> so I guess what I, I want to ask is how do you, um, especially with the Philippine American War in that erasure, how the Philippines was taught um, during the Commonwealth period, English, how does memory come into your work and how does erasure come into your work as well as Nick Joaquin? How does he play with those thematics, both in your work and, and Nick's? Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to answer your question <laughs> because, it's, I mean, it's, it's a good question. It's very difficult. I will comment on... <laughs> I will comment on what you were saying about how um, uh, you know a lot of these stories are about characters telling stories, um, and you know the story that I read from 
there's like this big monologue, you know, at the beginning, and that I, I read, I don't know, for seven minutes, and that there's a couple more pages of it, um, and I love it when authors let their their characters tell stories. I think like Murakami does this; he, he allows his characters do this a lot. Um, it, the story that I read reminded me of, in some ways, of a Murakami story only published, you know, 40 years before, um, and even today. Uh, uh, I feel like writers don't let their characters talk much, you know? Just, just like a couple quips back and forth. There's not a lot of dialogue. He's, he's a playwright, so he's such a good writer of dialogue, and I love hearing his characters talk for a long time and tell their, tell their own stories. It's, uh, uh, that's why I teach Isaac Bash of a singer all the time, and um, in his short stories, he, he's another one who lets his characters just go on and take the pages, you know? Do you want to talk about erasure or in erasure. your own work? Yeah. Erasure. <laughs> erasure. Um, I, I don't see much erasure in his stories. Actually, what he does is dreads up memories. When we talk about the uh, summer solstice, for instance, which is a male a male um, uh, festival up now where they throw water at you and then he turns it around. San Juan Bautista. Yes, yeah. he turns it around and makes it into this world, this woman festival, you know. It, it hearkens to a pre-Hispanic tradition. Uh, it might be filtered through a Christian Catholic sense and I'm, I'm glad that he did not go to the university yeah. to study literature. He quit school. He yeah, because he, he breaks the rules and he doesn't even know there are rules. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I'm, I'm just so glad he did not. Yeah. He quit school early, too. Like, yeah. how old? He was like 13. Yeah. yeah, and then he tried to go back and there's like, ah, I can't do that. And, um, he but basically, if he had not been such a powerful journalist, yeah. I don't think he would have been famous on the basis of his right, his fiction alone. Mm. As Quijano de Manila. Because the, the literary establishment when mm -hmm. I was growing up was totally like mm -hmm. rules, you mm -hmm. know. Yeah, and you have to understand even as a journalist what he was doing was he was writing about topics that people, people wouldn't write about soap opera people, you know. Yeah. He would write about the most mundane, the most quotidian topics, and then he'd talk about, you know, what's going on in the halls of Congress. So he, does, he has his political journalism, and he has the movie star journalism, and then he has, like, street canto boy journalism. So he, um, he really just did whatever he wanted, also. <laughs> <laughs> was, and they let him. He was the first to write about the student to the yeah, activism. Yeah. activism. Yeah, activism. Yeah. He's yeah. the ultimate badass. Yeah. yeah, he was a badass. Oh my God, the oh stories about him. God. The, uh, he yeah. taught me to drink and yeah, smoke. Yeah, I know. Yeah. He <laughs> <laughs> yeah, didn't even care. I was only 15 years old. Here, I have a beer. Yeah. <laughs> He's also famous for never taking a ride from anyone. He always goes in the taxis. Yeah. He, all, he he always wanted to be independent that way and not be in someone's car and would ride a taxi and he was it was quite funny when I started because he didn't drive also I was writing I was starting in journalism uh -huh. and then uh, a politician uh, suddenly gave me a Oh, a politician suddenly gave me a bottle of perfume and the person who was handling my tape recorder said I turned bright red <laughs> You know, and so I called Nick and I said, Nick, what will I do? And he said, do not turn down anything that comes in a bottle. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you are so funny. I'll address your question of erasure just because you brought it up. <laughs> because um, Nick Joaquin, you know, Nick Joaquin, um, you know, he, 
there's something very he's really about vital he's about vitality he's about mm -hmm. life i mean that's what that's very clear in his stories that he's he's really interested in in finding in in speaking in giving life to this this uh this this world of his in his imagination but it is clearly a world that treasures the moment you know which is really weird because he's always about the past um and but the past in nick Joaquin, i call it an ellipses it's all he's always doing ellipses because you're going to see you because he i mean um let's say Mass, Mass of St. Sylvester, it's really, it seems like it's about the Sp Spanish colonization. Really, it's about the ways it was written in 1940, it was published in 1946. It's really about, fuck you, America, this is what you did to Manila. Yeah. But he does it using Spanish colonization and this weird story of some gothic weird <laughs> guy with, a, with dead people's eyes. You know, and dead people's eyes are staring at this American, at staring at history and saying, fuck you, you did this to us. And so it's the America is an ellipses in the story. And he does that all the time. So for a writer, it's really instructive to see how you can have a vital, a vital story in the moment, but everything is there. He just enfolds. The whole story, not just the whole story of the Philippines, the whole story of Christendom, you know? Because it's not just um, Philippine history. It's a history of the world that he's really, he's moving us to. And he's always saying, fuck you, <laughs> you know? Thank you, thank you. In so many ways. In so many ways. <laughs> I guess that leads me to my third question and final question, which is about... Um, the question of literature and how one would categorize Nick Joaquin. And I was talking to another writer and how I would categorize him as both American literature but also Philippine literature. I would categorize both. But at the same time, I have a problem with the definition of literature when it's tied to nation. For one thing, I was just at the Kundaman, an Asian American writers conference in New York, and everyone in that room was Asian American. Everyone knew Amy Tan, but nobody really knew Carlos Bulosón, nor did anyone know um, Jose Garcia, Jose Villa Garcia. And that got to me. This says something about Filipino literature when we were the first colony of America. For me, I think just by, just by being a colony and thus learning English due to its education system and thus writing in English, that kind of means we are American English literature, I think. But so how would you, what is your response to this weird, <laughs> kind of weird question? How would you categorize Nick Joaquin? Why has it taken so long for America to publish a collection of Nick Joaquin's work? Um, I forgot who, what's the name of uh, the professor, oh my God. Don't put it out there. I forgot his name, but uh, he did this book on uh, the rise of the cosmopolitan literature. Uh, it's from Berkeley. Oh, uh, not Moretti? No, he's, uh, he's Vietnamese. Yes. Uh, but you should get that book. It's uh, <laughs> on the rise of the cosmopolitan literature. And it's about... <laughs> yes. Feng, I think his first name is Feng, P-H-E-N-G. Um, and it's, don't put it out there, <laughs> he might catch it, I'm in we the book. Erase that. Don't lie, tweet that. <laughs> I, I'm in the that book. Be part of the erasers. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but, but uh, yeah, you know, in this era of globalization, it's kind of difficult to talk about uh, nationalism of, of a nation state and so on. Um, actually, now we are uh, in contention with toxic nationalism uh, all over the place, like, you know, over there in Washington, D.C., make America great again. Mm. Yeah, that kind of thing. So, uh, writers are writers. 
A good story is a good story. That's that's my thinking on this. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know how. I mean, you know his work so much better than I do, both of you. Um, I don't know how I would classify him. Um, you know, I I wouldn't completely put the magical realism label yeah. on him. You know, yeah, it's like. It's not. It's not really that. Well, not even Marcus. Not, e right. not even the Latin. American, I mean, not even Marcus right. like that. Lately. Right. <clears throat> how would you? So how would you classify? Well, he's definitely a Filipino writer. I mean, uh, uh, ma and and I would say he's a Manilenio writer. <laughs> he's Manilenio, um, because I'm from I'm Waray, so I was like, okay, this is too much Manila. But um, um <clears throat> but. Uh, so he's definitely a Filipino writer, but he's historically, in terms of American literature, I would put him also, because he wrote, he's, I mean, I, I, that's actually why I thought Penguin, uh, Penguin needed to put this out, because I think in our, if we're, if we're doing classification, and people love classification, it's really in our blood to classify, it's kind of genetically ordained in us. Um, uh, the Anglophone, the American Anglophone, is actually an interesting grouping um, because you do have the UK Anglophone, you know, you have the, those guys. But, but this group of writers that kind of were created by the tragedy and by the horror of history, but are, are so much part of that American history, you know, at that erasure, of the Philippine War and the Fili and Philippine and the occupation of the Philippines by the United States, which um, which this this um, this book this book um, so, uh, somewhat uh, addresses or or tries um, to tries to satisfy um, that erasure is really. I mean, it's damning, um, I think, for America. Um, and it is uh, definitely long, over, long overdue. So that American Anglophone um, text, I think, is an interesting um, piece that we don't think about. I think the UK has uh, a better track record. Yeah. <laughs> Recognizing, you know, writers from the colonies, the countries they well, occupy. Well, we don't even yeah. we don't even teach um, the yeah. Filipino American War in the United States, and people don't know it. It was an insurgency. Insurrection. Yeah, I actually went to the. <laughs> I told the librarian at the Smithsonian, "Can you please at least change your folders? Change the word insurrection, you know." It's not yeah. the Philippine insurrection. It is the Filipino. It's a revolutionary war. It's the Philippine War of Independence. Can you change that? But of course, they never did. So they changed it silently. I think in the 1980s, the Library of Congress. Mm -hmm. But the the folders are still there. Right. But you know, <laughs> I complain every time I go. No, they change it from the Philippine insurrection to the Philippine American War, like in the late 80s or something. No, like I was that. there. Oh, I no, was there in the mind. 90s. They didn't change them. Okay. The Does audience? It, Do they have Does anybody questions? have any questions? I think yeah. I think we should start by having the audience ask some questions. <laughs> I think um, someone's gonna take one of our mics and then give it to the crowd. Oh, I wanted to uh, ask the first question. Um, uh, this is for Elda. Did, <laughs> sorry to put you on the spot. Could you tell us a little bit about how you, how the stories were selected into the or the genesis of the collection? Uh, I'll, I'll sit down. But <laughs> So um, just to give proper credit, uh, I was at a Kundiman event honoring Jessica Hagedorn, and Gina said to me, I think as I was leaving, we have to talk about Nick Joaquin. <laughs> and I was, I was like, yes, absolutely, I will talk to you about whatever you'd want to talk about. Um, and she later told me his centennial was coming up, I had to be educated on him and his influence and his legacy myself. That's sort of my job all the time with Penguin Classics. Um, when she told me more about him, his influence, his writings, I mean, spectacular career. We only, 
uh, you know, we only chipped a bit of his career by doing some short stories and a play, but many people know that he's had an extraordinary career as a journalist as well, playwright, etc. cetera. Um, then I'm, I think you helped me contact the estate and introduced me to Vince Raphael, the historian who is an integral part, an integral part to the classic. Um, Vince worked with the estate and Andrea Passion Flores, who is the agent for the estate, on what was available to us. Uh, also, from the publishing aspect, we had to figure out what rights were available. Um, and then we learned actually that this would be the first time that the books, that these writings would be available for publication outside of the Philippines. So after carving out all those contractual issues, it was really exciting to see what potential we had and uh, not only publishing it in Penguin Classics, but using the force of Penguin Random House to get it out again internationally in, in the branding of classics. Um, and working with Anvil, they were incredibly gracious to work with us because they're his key publisher yeah. in the Philippines too. So Vince and Gina and Ninochka, Luis Francia also gave me wonderful stories, Jessica Hagedorn. Um, for me as a publisher, it's, you know, I think Gina, again, has illuminated more about the importance of the, the ability to put him in. For many reasons, the goal with Penguin Classics is to educate readers as much as possible with texts that they probably haven't had access to in authoritative editions and bringing the best experts, scholars, and informed perspectives to contextualize that author. Um, we don't have to explain why Nick Joaquin is a classic to Filipinos or people that already know his work. But majority of Americans never heard of him. And in a way, it's, I guess, my subversive way of also teaching American history because you are introducing this to students and they're trying to figure out, well, wait a second. You know, I get a lot, wait, did he write in English? Is this a translation? I even you know, tell my colleagues that, no, no, English. And then there's just more and more of a learning process. Um, and it's, it's really just uh, a great honor to have him in classics. And I would say that that is the humbling position to be in working at Penguin is that we're learning more and more about like the greatest writers we can find around the world and just making our audience um, more understanding and educate, and educate them with what other parts of the world already know. So it's a network, it's a village of people make a penguin classic, basically. It takes a village. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> so do we have any questions from the crowd, please? Excuse me. Ninochka, I envy you for having had the uh, pleasure of meet, knowing and meeting, uh, meeting and knowing uh, Nick, uh, uh, and learning, drinking, and smoking from him. Uh, <laughs> But uh, you mentioned about the, his, his treatment of, of, of women characters in his works. And uh, I've long heard of um, Mr. Joaquin uh, being a closet gay, you know. Uh, and I, maybe only Mr. Joaquin can confirm that. Unfortunately, he's not around. But if, if, that, if that was the case, could that have had any bearing on his, his more informed way of seeing women? You know, not not in the gay sense of the in in that gay sense, but that um, uh, he was no macho, no macho guy. You know, kind of person. He was the erudite, uh, uh, learned person. You know, who saw through things, and um, um, how. Uh, and and then also, um, do you think there'll be uh, one day there'll be a, a compilation of all his works as? as a man of literature, as a journalist, uh, as a playwright, etc. you know? I hope so. Uh, some of his journalism pieces are really fantastic. One of them was uh, the story of incest, which was made into a classic film by Mike De Leon. Kisap uh, Mata? Kisap Mata. Um, was Nick gay? I don't know, but I will tell you this. Nick was very sensual. <laughs> he used to like, you know, 
<laughs> try to make any of my oh, any or all of my exes uh, jealous. Um, yeah. <laughs> I I I I don't know if he was guy. I I have no idea, but he was very macho in a way. In a way, he's very dominant, very dominant, really. If you meet him, he's such a he's such a huge personality, huge, you know, loud. Yeah. When I was released from military prison, I went to my mother's home, and then one afternoon, my older sister was like, "There's some." at the gate screaming your name. Who the hell is that? You know, because she's a very proper person and I look at, oh my God, it's Nick Joaquin. <laughs> but to this day, I had no idea how he found out I had been released and where I was. He was that kind of person. Uh, just yeah. one follow-up. Uh, yeah. He's written about everybody, as, as uh, Jean had mentioned. Uh, show business, etc. Yeah. I remember he had written about Nora Onor, the erstwhile uh, mega Amazing super actor. superstar yeah. of, of the Philippines, uh, who's yeah. still very active as an actor. And uh, but what uh, what caught my attention, made me sit up, was when I read uh, the Question of Heroes, that book, you know. But but I really I love the blend of journalism and literature that he came up with. Now my question is. He's written so, I mean, even, even about Henry C. I think he was commissioned to write about Henry C. Uh, I don't know if that ever came out. But um, he's written about every, everybody else except himself. I was wondering if he was predisposed to writing a memoir. No. He never, I think never. The closest would have been. I think the closest would have been his book, Manila, My Manila. Yeah. <laughs> he wrote about the city, yeah. which he loved. But that was the thing, even though he was very dominant. He did not have a big ego. Yeah. That was the amazing thing. You know. He was very private too. He was very private, lived with his mother all his life. His um, sisters, two sisters. He lived in the house where his mother lived yeah. forever. Um, very private. There were, I think, only six of us who had this phone number. But he was definitely a character. I remember I was watching this play in the Philippines, Oleana. It's this David Mamet play, and it's yeah. about a girl who's going to, you know, accusing her um, teacher of harassment. And then, well, I saw Nick Joaquin. I, I was really scared of actually um, <laughs> getting anywhere near Nick Joaquin. Um, so Nick Joaquin was there, and you can tell Nick Joaquin had these huge ears. Um, and his face is like a Roman coin. So, you know, you know, you know, it's okay. And so he's there, and so the, the, the professor's getting mad on stage, and he's going, go get her, get her. So that's what he's saying in the middle of the play. <laughs> get her. <laughs> that was really weird. Um, but, yeah, he was definitely a, a character and lived his life. <clears throat> Well, you know the story, I, I mentioned it in the foreword, the story of Jose Lacaba, the poet, who was imprisoned um, during the, um, very early on in the Marcus years. And he was, um, a, he was a very good friend of Nick Joaquin. And um, at that point in time, uh, Marcus wanted to use him, use Nick Joaquin, because of his power and fame. Yeah, the first lady. Um, to, so they wanted to nominate him the first national artist. And um, he eventually only agreed because he was going to refuse it. He only agreed um, if the regime would, um, would free his friend, uh, actually, the poet Pete. So. I actually told him to do that. <laughs> yeah, you were telling, you were saying that. Yeah, yeah because the, the question came via Adrian Cristobal to me. He's a spokesman of uh, Fernand Marcos. Uh, and speechwriter. 
And so uh, I said, uh, let me call him and let me ask, because mm -hmm. he said the first lady wants to be sure that he's going to accept it. So I called Nick, and Nick went mm -hmm. berserker on the phone, like, bah, 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 bah. I said, Nick, 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 Nick. This is how I talk to him when I want something. Nicky, Nicky, Nick, 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 Nick. Nicky, Nicky, Nicky. You bargain. I said, what? Tell them to free. Mm -hmm. uh, you know. Pete re recently wrote to me yeah. just to say um, thank you for mentioning that um, that story because it it was just I didn't know. I mean, as growing up in the Philippines under martial no, law, I didn't, those stories were not told. That story came out only when Marcus was gone. There were only three of us who knew about it. Myself, my companion at the time, Adrian, Cristobal, and Nick. Mm -hmm. And us. again, that interesting yeah. um, privacy of Nick Joaquin, you know, that was a hero move. He didn't speak about it. I, uh, I was there when he was given the... <laughs> oh, the my National Artist God. Award. Oh, my yes. God. It was Terrible. disgusting. Yeah. They had all this uh, glitterati, glitter, glitter coming down from the ceiling. Is that the event where they ran out of beer so he left? No. Oh, okay. No. <laughs> that was uh, the event where when he was to deliver his talk. Oh, yeah. He went up on stage and then later he told me he was gripping the lectern so hard because he was scared they would drag him off the stage. <laughs> Because he made a veiled attack on mm. the first lady. Mm. Yeah, that was the time. That's how I got to the National Art Center because Adrian, yeah, he was the one who arranged all of that. Mm. Adrian was something else too. Yeah, he's nuts. Yeah. We had very strange people. <laughs> In the Marcos yeah. government. <laughs> Any other questions from the crowd? Hi. Um, firstly, thank you all for being here. Um, I'm Filipino American, and I never had the chance to read Nick Joaquin growing up. Um, I was raised in Southern California, and it just kind of was never part of the curriculum. So, I'm like, I'm actually like really glad that you're all here to kind of talk about this. And, and I'm doing research at NYU this summer about kind of Filipino-American literature and, and, and the transnationality of it. Um, and, and similar to Melissa's question earlier, I, I'm wondering how you all in your work and, and how uh, Nick Joaquin and his work kind of address this idea of transnationality and the kind of ever-looming presence of like Americans and, and, and Spanish folks and, and people who are just kind of always just trying to get in our business <laughs> and it's really annoying because I just want to go back to the Philippines and like have a good time and they're being really persistent with the whole colonialism thing. You, you read Woman of Oh yeah, um, but the, the question was about how um, we deal with it in our own work. Yeah, okay. um, so. I think my first novel, which is very much about a Filipino man who's just obsessed with America and New York City, um, it's very obvious um, in, that, in that work. And then uh, in my new novel, I don't really, it doesn't really involve, um, it doesn't have Filipinos in it, but um, it does take place at the end of the Vietnam War, and so it's funny. I'm not sure, I, I might just be drawing a connection here because of your question, but it is at a time where, you know, uh, we're occupying another Southeast Asian country. So um, I guess that's, that's how it sort of is threaded through, throughout my work. Well, um, I guess in mine, I, I have two novels um, that, well, the two novels that are, well, second one's going to be, that's going to be published in the States, and the first one that was published in the States, interestingly, they, um, both of those novels move from the Philippines to um, the United States, France, 
uh, Italy, I think. Um, so uh, that's Gun Dealer, and Gun Dealer's Daughter. And then this, the one that's coming out um, from Soho Press, I think next year, uh, The Unintended, is uh, an American film director who's, who goes to the Philippines to Ali Mall in Cubao. <laughs> um, uh, and meets a translator, a Filipino translator. She's doing a movie about the Filipino-American War because of something that has to do with her father, who did something, who did a movie on the Vietnam War, and she she discovers that really that his her father's research was really he merged those two wars together, the Filipino-American War and the Vietnam War, and so she wants to go. She wants his translator to go with her to Balangiga in Samar, where there was this horrific massacre of Filipinos, also a raid by Filipinos of an American garrison. Filipinos killed around 48 Americans, and um, Americans killed around 30,000 Filipinos in retaliation. So she wants her to go to that, to Samar with her. And so there's this interesting, I think there's that mix of, and they, they both tell, the translator reads the script and wants to read, and redoes the script. So you don't know who is telling which script in the novel. So even that, you know, that transnationality is right there um, in that story, although the whole novel is set in, um, in Cubao and then, and then they move on. They take a road trip to Samar. Um, Nick Joaquin did his woman who had two navels that's set in Hong Kong and then Manila. Um, and he wrote that with a grant from the United States you know, a Ford Fellowship, I think. So, um, you know, there's, there are ways, of, there, I think for a writer, I, I'm, a, I'm a writer in New York, a Filipino writer in New York um, who grew up in the Philippines. I think, I think the world is very big for me. I don't really have a sense of smallness because if, you're, if you grow up in the Philippines as a writer, your world is very big. Because you're actually thinking about everyone in the world, not just America. And so I grew up reading Miguel de Unamuno, like he's like my neighbor or something, the Spanish philosopher of the Enlightenment. Um, or, uh, you know, the Japanese writers, you know, Akutagawa, um, or um, your, um, that's my world. My world is very big growing up in the Philippines. It's not really American, um, except that I grew up with American history, which is another weird thing. You know, I grew up, I memorized, I still know the Gettysburg Address by heart, because that's my upbringing. I was brought up with American colonial education, but that American colonial education is leavened by um, uh, an, a very interesting um, Catholic, Catholic and a small Catholic, Catholicism of view, meaning the world, we are part of the whole world, you know, um, you know, the Suez Canal, you know, all of, the, all of these openings into um, the Philippines, it's very big. So coming into the States made things seemingly small for me. I don't know, because it's not just about America. In my case, I think I'm moving uh, the opposite direction. I'm involved in deconstructing or destroying or removing the layers of, of identities which have been imposed on who and what we are. And ironically, this thing that I'm working on is about Maria McKilling, or McKilling, not Maria, but McKilling in New York City. <laughs> I like these ironies. Hi. Um, so my question is, um, so when you're reading Joaquin, um, in what ways does he remind you of another great Filipino writer, novelist, uh, Penguin Classics author, uh, Jose Rizal? So like, you know, the resemblances, the continuities, or even discontinuities when you read Joaquin, does he remind you of, of, of Rizal? How are they different? How are they similar? You know I wrote a whole novel about Rizal. <laughs> so um, I have a lot to say about that. Um, what's interesting about, for me, uh, for both writers, is that they are 
sui generis. They are themselves. You know, Jose Rizal, given that his influences were, let's say, Eugene Sue, the, the, the French writer, or Victor Hugo, you know, um, uh, you know the, fr the French blockbusters, um, and that, of course, he was influenced by Balagtas, etc., um, and even German folk tales. Um, there's no, there's no, there's no real writer like Rizal. I, I mean, he's really, he did what he did. Um, he's, he, he is himself. And the, I think it's weird because Nick Joaquin is also the same. He is himself. There's no one, there's no one quite like Nick Joaquin and there's no one quite like Jose Rizal. Um, given, which is really weird because uh, Rizal more or less created the notion of the country. I mean, Noli Mitangher is basically like, okay, this is how the nation was begotten. Um, and yet, uh, and, and of course, the social, re the, the novel, of, the political novel is really a big part of Philippine literary um, history, whether you're doing Tagalog or whether you're doing uh, Waray or, or any of the languages. Um, but what he did, the way he put together um, Europe, Philippines, um, folk, folk uh, Catholicism, etc., is is really just him. I mean, it's that's that's what I think is very interesting about the two, um, but they're very dissimilar. Nick Joaquin is not at all like Rizal, for me, in my view. They um, they have their own voices. I mean, I've mentioned it in the foreword that Rizal wrote in Spanish before the war, before revolution. And Joaquin wrote in English as a victim of war. And so those are two very, historically, that's a, that's a really interesting split. Have you read Rizal? I have. <laughs> but I, I can't be quizzed on it. I mean, I, haven't, I was only supposed to read Nick Joaquin for tonight. <laughs> That was uh, that was great. Should we? Um... Well, I I find a, a degree of similarity between the two. This sense of dislocation, of being not quite here, or being out of place, and therefore creating a place of the imagination. I think those two. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Marivir Montevon and I am with the New York Press Club, Phil M. Press Club of New York. I have two questions, uh, questions for Ninochka and Gina. Um, Mr. Nick Joaquin has been very influential for journalists, especially when he won the 1996 Ramon Magsaysay Award, when he wrote a, uh, an essay and he, he read it too, um, asking journalists to be creative nonfiction writers, meaning to be descriptive in our hurried reportage of uh, the events of the day. So he was very um, encouraging when he asked that we should do graceful speech um, and be eloquent in, in reporting, in, like treating a story like it was uh, the Red Sea opened Things like that. So he was very. I love. I love reading him and listening to him. And so, as far as, far as I'm concerned, Ninochka and uh, Gina, you are also into journalism. So how do you? Right now, most journalists are into um, very eloquent writing and descriptive writing, other than straight news. And but the element on um, culture is kind of missing. So is there a way for for you to have an advice on how to deepen the sense of culture that the hurried reporters are doing or engaged in right now, especially digital read, media. I Thank think you. you have to read your history and you have to read your literature. Yeah. Oh. You have to know it. Oh. I think... Uh, one problem is, uh, and this is something I learned from Nick Joaquin in both his uh, journalism and his fiction. You pay attention to the integrity of the story. The story is the 
first thing, which is very difficult for me because I grew up being asked the question, for whom do you write? Um, until I got to Yenan and I stood on the spot where the forum on art and literature was held and there was a picture of these 26 writers with Chairman Mao and I said, of oh, these 26 writers, who attended the forum. <coughs> Did anyone become really a good writer? <laughs> <laughs> and the guide said, no, wow, wow, oh. <laughs> that's it. Uh, you know, back to, you maintain this, the primacy of the integrity of the story. That's it. I will say there, there are many um, journalists, I think, that are writing very interesting um, yeah. pieces. I mean, in the Philippines right now, on the Duterte regime, I think, I think there are a lot. So. And, they're, and they're, they're storytellers. Oh, I have been asked how Nick yeah. would uh, mm. respond to uh, the Duterte yeah. regime. And, uh, he would be drinking with Duterte. He, he would be bubula and bibeg. You know. What's the question? No, no, no. You mentioned that there are writers, journalists now who write uh, very poetically, you know? And, and uh, I'd just like to mention, uh, since you mentioned about uh, writers, uh, journalists, about that Atlantic piece that came out this month uh, on uh, by uh, somebody who unfortunately passed away, um, uh, Mr. Tizon, I think, uh, on uh, the indentured slave of his family. You know, that was... That's a very moving piece. That's piece of rep, you know, in a way, piece of reportage, but at the same time, very introspective. Let's do one or two more questions. Um, the man in the middle. We have one question from the live stream. Oh. Two questions from the live stream, and then we'll do one more. Um, okay. So it's. Okay, so Brian K. Lyon asks, friends are all watching. how do you compel the younger generations of Asian Americans to take interests in English language and composition? And do you believe that the current curriculum with which English is taught in America adheres too steadfastly to the classics? Does anyone want to take that? <laughs> okay, I teach <laughs> literature, so I teach literature too. Um, to uh, uh, high school kids in New York, um, yeah, I mean, the, you're you're talking about a very entrenched canonical literature, um, and I do think uh, maybe prep schools are more canonical than a more Western oriented probably than um, than the public schools because public schools really do. I mean, you have to read um, Native Son, for instance, and um, in the public schools. Um, but I don't, yeah, it's true. It's, it's highly canonical in the schools. So that's why it's great that, um, this book is out and we hope that all of the high school English teachers out there listening on the live stream. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, Nick Wakin. Teach this book, please. <laughs> what was the other question? Oh, we got here. You want to answer more? Yeah, since Nick Joaquin did not, he barely finished high school, uh, what, or how did he hone his writing skills, especially in English? And what shaped his mind, his, uh, himself? How big was his world? Uh, was he a voracious re reader, uh, well-traveled? Um, by the time he was traveling, he was already formed fully formed, you know. But I think his uh, love for the church, you know, 
at some point uh, um, enabled him to be acquainted with other parts of uh, the world's literature. But he did not come from a family that was uh, deprived, I must say. Um, his brother uh, actually married my mother's cousin <laughs> or eloped with her. Uh, but his family, his brother was a very well-known uh, musician and so on. So they gravitated uh, to a certain degree around the arts. Yeah. Uh, I believe in the uh, introduction um, they talk about this very thing and that he was, uh, he felt when he dropped out of school that he could, um, he could learn so much more, you know, just by himself, like through his own yeah. reading. And so he just religiously went to um, the National Library, yeah, I believe. Library. Yeah. And I, I, I think as a journalist, I think because he was a journalist at a very young age, that's what really honed it. Because he had to he had to address an audience. And I think that's actually a very interesting move for a writer, to recognize what journalism does for you. You're always thinking about your reader and connecting to the reader. And I think if you're doing a lot of literary stuff on your own, you prob and you, um, I think that really enriched um, his work. Because you could, you could see in, in the text, in the, in the stories, that he, he understands. He understands how to move the reader, even a question of heroes, a lot of that is history as gossip. He's just kind of gossiping about history. A lot of historians will go, oh, I don't know, Nick Walken. But, um, but because of the way, it's so compelling because he's, he's, he's saying, I know what you want to know about Bonifacio. I know what you want to know about Aguinaldo. And so he tells that interesting underside or uh, chismis. Um, uh, but, but there was a tradition in the Philippines where you read entire libraries. I read entire libraries, no kidding. That was a, yeah. such a tradition. Yeah. yeah, I remember at the British Council and when, because um, I used to go to the embassy libraries and that, yes. that's where I, I got all my, um, all my reading done. And the name of the rose came out and I could not get a, the copy I, I had my, my borrower's card, but it took me months to get it because they only had two copies, the goddamn uh, British Council. Um, yeah. And so every single person in Manila was reading Name of the Rose from the British Council. Yeah. As far as, and the, I loved reading the list of readers because you know the, they still had those library cards so you could see yes. all of these great writers were reading Name of the Rose one after the other, it was amazing. I mean, it's really, it was an, it's an amazing, I thought it was an amazing reading culture. Of course, it's a particular class and group, you know, and we have to recognize class in the Philippines is really, uh, it's the problem. Um, uh, and recognizing that the group that you're coming, the group that Joaquin was coming from, his father was a colonel in the Filipino-American War. He was a colonel for Aguinaldo. He became, his father was a, a lawyer, became a uh, isn't that right? That was, that was what he was, a cel celebrated lawyer. He died um, when Nick Joaquin was quite young. But still, you have your Buena Familia stuff. You know, yeah. that's that kind of issue that um, Filipinos have, that not everyone is going to the British Council to, um, it knows that you can get a, a free library card. But, but the kind of reading that was being done among... Massive. It's amazing. Massive. Yeah, you have to understand that the Noli Mitangere was like a Samis, that novel that people would just give yeah. in secret to people. It was a well, reading. Marcos' dictatorship, you know. Oh, yeah. I mean, there were like underground papers all over. Oh, Pete Lacaba's poems, oh, all yeah. of those things. Those were secret yeah. things that you read. But I will tell you something. When uh, my first year at the University of the Philippines, I thought I was so stupid. Now, one summer, I decided to read all the books in the literary section of the UP library. And I got up to letter L. <laughs> Two books a day. We were crazy. We one wanted to know. <laughs> one of my this is the thing. One of my friends here in New York, so he's a Filipino writer in New York, and he, he lived across from um, this bookstore on 
in near Lincoln Center. So every day he would just read the history of philosophy and he just went through the whole 20 volumes. Oh, yeah. Just going to Barnes and Noble, reading the history of philosophy. He, was, he still had his Manila that. habits. We used to do that, entire volumes, you know. And when we talk about, uh, let's say, Thomas Mann, it's not one book, but his entire body of work. <laughs> But it was, uh, I think you have to understand that uh, the whole country is looking for answers. At least we were. And there's a sense, I think there's a sense with Duterte that there is a betrayal uh, of the people uh, by these people who read. And I think we do rec we need to recognize that, you know, we need to recognize our privilege and our class. And, and, we, and when we don't, you know, that's what we get. I think the people who read also betray themselves. <laughs> Very true. Yeah. Let's do one final question. Yeah, hello. I'm um, just curious about his relationship with uh, uh, Frankie Chanel Jose, given that they're you know, very close in their age. Did they, did they collaborate on anything? You know, did, did they hang out a lot? I mean, given that they're you know, two giants of you know, Philippine you know, literary scene. <laughs> Can you answer that? Well, um um, Nick is a very gracious person and he's very polite unless you rile him up. Uh, so he used to go to uh, Franklin's, uh, Frankie's uh, book sh bookstore and hang out with the other writers. He likes to drink beer and Frankie serves beer. So that's about it. <laughs> I, uh, that's it. I, that's it. I think you want, let's just do one more, the man in the blue. Or, I think blue. <laughs> Hi, I was just wondering, um, since you're talking about class now, do you think that there's a specific class uh, element in his in Wilkins' writing, or a limitation in that respect? Hmm. Offhand, um, I think he's very aware of the groups of people that he's writing about. I think he's aware that I'm doing a bourgeois group right now. Um, he kind of makes fun of it in Order of Melchizedek. I think that's a huge satire on the upper classes. Um, of course, <laughs> the whole of women who had two navels is like, uh, like these are people who are ruined by Spanish, who are, who are, who are broken. Um, in, they're broken psychologically by their... Spanish colonial privilege um, world. Um, and I think there's a, I would say, it was an interesting th uh, that point that he made to you, um, Ninoch Kevin says, because you're Manichaean. His work is not Manichaean. He's not a black and white person. He's not an either or. He, he is always dialectical. So that, and that's why the specificity of detail in Nick Joaquin is really important to recognize because when you're, and it's, it's really good for writers too, because when you're that specific, when you're like really in the muck of detail, um, you, you can escape the binary because you're so, the sense of space and, and time and character and um, Manila, et cetera, it's so you're, he, he, what he comes to is a very dialectical place. And I think that's why, um, uh, even as you're, it's very clear that he deals with a particular class of people almost all the time, um, except for, um, um, except for a few, I, I actually, there are actually a lot of others, but um, even though he foregrounds a lot of, upper class people. I think he's very aware of the, of the class situation. I think it's not a matter of class, but a matter of sector. Uh, his people are very intelligent, I must say. You know, they're very uh, intellectual, self-analytical, self-critical, you know. But he has, for instance, he has those, he has the, um, the people in Summer Solstice, for instance, the real hero there is that is the maid 
who's the Tatarin, who's the yeah. um, the goddess. The goddess. She becomes the goddess for one day. So he has those. He has a lot of a lot of his stories are invert, constantly subverting, so that just that one day in summer solstice, the maid is the god. Well, thank you guys so much for coming. Let's give everyone a hand. <laughs> Our last activity is to do the last three raffles. Yay! We're going to have the writers pick out a ticket and then read the numbers aloud. <laughs> Can I get them all? No! <laughs> Give them all books. Okay. Seven, nine. 79. Woo! <laughs> All right, uh, 69. All right. And this one is 5-3. Five, 5-3. Three. Five, three. 53. One more, one more. <laughs> this one has a name, oh, anyway. Um, Six six. Sixty six. Not you, Petra. <laughs> Seventy six. Leah. Yeah. Okay. Woo, thank you, guys. Let's give them another round of applause, please. Thank you for coming, and let's let's talk as well. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>